OK. Um, is this thing working? Can you hear me back there? Yeah? OK. <clears throat> um, I'll, I'll, I'll work around what was supposed to be some visual stuff, but uh, I think it'll be OK. The day after President Fernando Lugo was impeached in a strange two-hour session of the Paraguayan Congress last year, close to 120 functionaries of the Phytosanitary Regulation Agency, an agency called SINAVE, um, were fired and chased out of the building. Several of those who remained entered the offices of the now empty Citizen Participation Unit of the agency, um, erased the hard drives, loaded all the records they found into boxes, and took them down to a recently decommissioned pesticide facility uh, to burn them and um, to burn them and get rid of all vestiges of them. And they hold, held a barbecue there at the same time. The records included all the files from two principal projects of the unit, the analysis and collection of native seeds created on a shoestring by two underfunded agronomists, and the records of all the complaints received from peasant communities about pesticide drift and the visits that the uh, unit made to these communities afterwards. Now, proponents of the participation unit had predicted something like this might happen since the moment when Lugo, already a very controversial left-wing president, uh, had appointed an environmentalist to head this fairly obscure regulatory body, this thing called SINAVE. They often talked about the record-keeping of the agency as dangerous to agribusiness interests because it could reveal the excesses and often illegal practices of farmers. In saying this, they participated in a fairly standard analytic approach to regulatory agencies and the records they produce. In this story about regulation, a record is information, a set of free-floating representations of the objects of agriculture that by circulating beyond the field and farm make agriculture both more efficient for proponents and, and transparent for uh, some critics. Now, I want to argue here, what I want to argue here is that this story doesn't really do a good job of accounting why the records were made in the first place and especially why they were destroyed afterwards. Yep. Hey, look at that. My cat. OK. <laughs> OK. Uh, which one of these I just advanced like this? OK. So we got, this is the facility where they burned the, uh, the records. And uh, this is, that's Sinave, the promotional material. Um, the first way to reorient this analysis is to pay closer attention to the role that records play in the materiality of regulation. Now, I want to start from the premise that Sinavi's records do, are not freestanding information about objects, but rather extensions of the things that they supposedly regulate, whose enhanced capacities are vibrant with political possibility. Now, during the controversy around Sinavi, no one particularly cared about the data produced by the agency. Rather, they cared about these enhanced capacities and the enhanced connections that the records made possible with the objects objects of regulation. And that slight inversion of our analytic attention suggests a reading of the politics of record making that sees it not as stabilizing the present, but as an aleatory practice of, um, of creating connections, enhancing the agency of things, and finally constructing possible futures. And this is particularly interesting when we see record making practices combined with placemaking, which it turns out the citizenship, citizen participation unit um, was all about. Who makes records is important if we assume that in so doing, they're also making worlds. Now, to give you a sense of why this is consequential in Paraguay, uh, here's a little agrarian backstory. Um, at the beginning of the 1990s, uh, Paraguayan agriculture was dominated by two very contrasting crops, cotton and soybeans. And the cotton economy was the economic access of land reform, a state-sponsored so sponsored settlement that since 1963 had converted millions of hectares of forest east of Asuncion into settlements of smallholders who saw themselves as building new communities in a new nation state. Now, soybeans, by contrast, were planted on a much larger scale by Brazilian migrants living in the eastern frontier uh, closer to the Brazilian border. They brought agricultural inputs from the neighboring countries and sold their products there, relying on Brazilian expertise, laboratories, facilities, and uh, shippers. Poor rural Paraguayans were enrolled in the sector primarily as laborers. But in the 1990s, as drought, pests, and poor prices sent the cotton economy into decline, campesinos also became less useful on soy farms when their work as weeders was replaced with chemical herbicides, uh, making the beans much more profitable than before. By the 2000s, uh, peasants were fleeing the countryside as income decreased and clouds of agrochemicals increased. And this was in 2004. This is a fairly uh, a scene you'd see fair, fairly often with people planting the beans so quickly they wouldn't even bother to rip the old houses out of the landscape that they had um, gotten rid of people. Now, for most of this history, soy farmers considered the Paraguayan state uh, backward and populist, but also easily ignored. And this changed around 2000, as soy farmers sought to expand their market beyond Brazil, which was actually a very restricted black market for them. 
Um, and this required national regulatory infrastructure robust enough for EU importers at the beginning. Um, they succeeded in creating Senave by restructuring several disorganized agencies in the Ministry of Agriculture, agreeing to steep fees on its services, and outfitting a, a network of port and border authorities with the uh, country's most high-tech biology and chemistry labs, capable of measuring and recording new data about beans. Now, the standard way of seeing this kind of process, both by the industry and by most of the critics um, in Paraguay, is to treat Sinave and the regulatory work it does as part of a framework for trade. Um, regulation is separate from the commodities themselves, merely containing and conditioning their movement. The analysis affects this separation through the concept of information. That is, the object of regulation is not a thing per se, but its representation. And in this case, the harmonization of standards not only reduces things like beans to an objective singularity, it then translates them into quantifiable units of communication within a larger system of harmonized language. And this is all very, should echo a lot of the stuff about um, Hayekian approaches to, uh, to information that we heard this morning. Now, regulators' self-description is closely mirrored by a critical literature that sees standards as, pra as a practice of disciplining through visibility. And yet, neither of these descriptions captures what soy farmers were up to when they chose to lobby so hard and pay so much to create the agency to begin with. It was equipped to produce large quantities of data about agricultural production, but very little in the way of kind of aggregate representations of things. So it didn't make things transparent. There was no big reveal to be had here. Um, nor were they interested in the overall efficiency of the global soybean market uh, beyond Paraguay. Instead, it was almost exclusively about helping national in the national industry deal with its increasing quantities of beans by allowing them to be articulated into other markets and practices. For instance, establishing new standards about humidity and purity made it easier for multinational corporations like Cargill and Dreyfus to build silos and container fleets throughout the country. But perhaps more importantly, certification of phytosanitary purity made it much easier to find overseas buyers for grains since they could, easily, since they could already be certified to meet the standards of purity and humidity demanded by importers. From the industry perspective, a more useful way to thinking about these certification schemes is actually to invert the relationship posited by a representationalist critique. For them, certification doesn't produce legible facts, but rather qualifies the beans and makes them able to do things that they couldn't before you qualified them. To adopt a phrase from uh, Bonsoir de Vesson and Sting Stengers, what the test does is produce informed beans, matter augmented by information. The um, if, as Latour has said, a fact is a state of the world loaded into a, uh, a statement, then what an agency like Sinavi does is load that statement back into states of the world, where you have these representations, but they never, they never travel very far from the things they represent. And often, the certificates, which are made by these inspectors, the certificates are literally these papers that get stamped and then get thrown in with the grain to go across the ocean and, and, and get opened up the other end. Um, informed beans store better, travel better, win the, win the approval of clients better, and generally make for a better, more versatile commodity. Sinave is less a state agency conta uh, containing the bean trade and more a rather prosaic piece of the export chain. The records it keeps are merely augmentations of those commodities. And this is why when um, this environmentalist, Miguel Lovera, uh, created a citizen par participation unit, um, it was a curious and kind of radical bureaucratic in, in innovation, not because it had a chance to create a new and grand kind of record that might get to the bottom of what was going on, um, but because it invites different kinds of people to participate in the creation of the beans that are then going to be uh, shipped overseas. Now, I've been positioned for Paraguay for some time as a sympathizer with rural land struggles, and most of my good friends are campesinos who are vehemently anti-soy, and neither they nor I thought that this appointment would be of any consequence to them at all. If one hoped the Senave was going to engineer a big reveal, which is what everyone hoped, uh, the actual tools that it used were rather bland. Um, even after the citizen particip participation unit started to circulate in the countryside, when I asked rural friends what they thought they did, most of them said something like, Senave, aren't those the people who just measure things? It was a little bit more complicated than this, but not very much. Um, when I traveled with the unit, what they would do is they would accept calls from these different communities and complaints about pesticides. They'd arrange for a meeting to which they would then uh, invariably show up late. Uh, participation usually involved uh, community members venting about respiratory and digestive problems, crop failures, homes made unlivable by noxious chemicals, and there were the other stories, the job loss, the broken health clinics and water systems, dispossession, murder, children dying and being born deformed, all this whole package of, of issues that, were, that would be vented for hours in these meetings. 
agents from the participation unit would respond with sympathy, agreeing this was a kind of situation that was intolerable and that St. Ave was there to end the impunity of soy farmers. But eventually they would have to sort of draw the meetings to a close, this was always a little bit awkward, they'd draw it to a close and they'd admit that there was actually very little they could do and that the soy farmers were, for the most part, acting legally. The only thing that most soy farmers, the only regulation that they seemed to break consistently um, was this, uh, this very little regulatory article that stipulated that any field that touched someone else's property or public space needed to be flanked by a security buffer of dense vegetation at least two meters high and five meters thick. Uh, this is an example of a bad buffer, right? Um, and this you see all over Paraguay. There's supposed to be two meters high, five meters thick, and there are all these little spindly things. Um, and so since the, the farmers invariably broke this regulation, it became this thing that you could do um, with the unit to try to, to try to make people feel like you were responding to them. Um, so they would ask a few community members to accompany them to the edges of soy fields where they would pull out their measuring tapes, measure off the requisite distances, and then plant makeshift stakes, usually with little white bags that they found in the gutters that they would um, uh, tie as flags to the end of the sticks to mark off where the security buff buffer ought to be. Then they'd fill out non-compliance citations to deliver to the producers who would grab the forms and throw them in the mud. Um, inspectors often held a final quick meeting with the plaintiffs when things got really awkward to explain to them the next step, the torturous process of legal wrangling and repeat inspections that might, if they actually occurred, eventually end up in a fine of about $1,000, which was far less than the price of planting the buffer to begin with. Everyone present understood that these tape measures and carbon copies um, were hardly adequate answers to the enormity of the sense of injustice they were feeling. And they didn't translate the complaints into durable facts about life in the countryside, nor did they bring serious legal action to bear on the situation. But much to my surprise, this particular translation of the politics of suffering into apparently superficial recording of the width of buffers attracted renewed attention from both sides of the Sinave conflict. For all their doubts, campesinos kept calling this participation unit back to their communities um, to the point that the Sinave had to, had to increase its staff considerably to meet the demand. Um, and the soy lobby complained vociferously about it. And as I said, when they finally threw this guy out, one of the first things they did is go into the office and burn all the records. Now, I eventually changed my interpretation of the measuring ritual when I realized how much it resembled the work of surveyors I'd watched uh, measuring out plots for settlers and land colonies several years earlier. This suggested a connection between Senave's uh, records and a key part of Paraguay's last great populist na nation building project. Now, campesinos I know from across the land reform area fondly remember the visits of surveyors even decades later, and there are communities that are named after the surveyors that came through. This is a really symbolically very important thing to people. Well into the 21st century, they continued to petition the state to measure their land, paid bribes to the surveyors, and enjoyed helping them, carrying the equipment around, stretching the measuring tapes. The relationships between campesinos and these surveyors was highly paternalistic and rife with corruption, but it was rarely a sham. Measurement produced a very specific kind of record, a government-issued occupancy permit that could be used to wave off police during the all-too-frequent raids against supposed squatters. It didn't always work, but sometimes it did, which meant that a campesino plot with a record of measurement was mildly less likely to be the target of eviction than one without such a record. The more one requested and carried out these measurements, in other words, the more solid people's rights became and the more they believed that the state was something more than simply the police force of the rich. From one perspective, this recording the measurement of smallholder plots is analogous to the recording of soybean humidity by the Sinave. One produces informed territory and the other produces informed beans. Whether or not anything is produced that rises, above the level of, to, uh, rises to the level of abstract information is not as important as the augmented capacities of the things being measured themselves. And yet there's an important difference here because land is never only a commodity but also a key part of campesino world making. In his well-known uh, meditation on how people build the world around them, Tim, Tim Ingold relies on a similar analytic device to the one I've been used, uh, using here to talk about certification. Um, Ingold makes the differences between a house and a home, drawing on Heidegger, um, that which where a house is a mere container for what can only be assumed to be human habitation, and a home is that which human inhabitants build around them in the process of dwelling. And one can extend this to the distinction between space and place and the distinction between land and settlement. The first is recorded as an abstraction, a commodifiable and quantifiable substance which serves as the container for the production of agrarian commodities. The second is recorded as an extension of the act of dwelling, like the, surveying, like the surveyed occupancy permit, which serves dwelling and permanence rather than commodification. 
Now, the records of the Citizen Participation Unit were perhaps unthreatening in legal and informational terms, but by bringing campesinos into, into the regulatory process and inviting them to participate in recording the details of land use, they mixed up the process of producing soybean commodities um, and campesino settlement making. The te first, there's a couple of ways in which this mix-up becomes threatening. First, the temporality of the state is reversed from that of soy farmers. The production of soybeans um, requires the state to seem like an already accomplished instrument, whereas campesinos always saw the state as something that they were building in the process of measuring things. Second, campesino settlements and the surveys that underwrote them were always antagonistic to rural elites. Um, so often what campesinos would do in order to try to take more land is, is uh, get a surveyor to come and survey the land of their rich uh, landowners to see if there were bits of the property that weren't actually covered by their title. So by asking surveyors to check and update property records, campesino settlers aid at the edges of private property while enrolling the state to their cause. They did this legally, but also much to the irritation of the owners, they did it materially as groups of campesinos would often, aiding the survey, would often feel empowered to jump the fence along with the surveyors, which they were not allowed to do, although the surveyors were, um, and help them measure and move measuring, uh, surveying stakes. By 2008, a palpable shift had taken place with many campesino organizations abandoning hope of expanding the frontier onto new land and instead trying to slow down the expansion of beans. And this is where Sanave kind of comes into the breach where you have the land reform agency is no longer capable of finding new land, but Sanave is one of those things that allows one to measure the landscape in such a way as to figure out where more solid barriers can be applied. What always angered soy farmers most about the practice was the presence of campesinos around the edges of their field, holding measuring tapes and stakes while the state functionary recorded numbers on a clipboard. It drove them crazy in the same way to find campesinos riding the elevators in Senave. Like private property, Senave also needed to remain stable for them to trust it as an instrument for the production of informed beans. And so long as Senave's primary role was recording the qualities of beans, then it remained linked to soy farmers' interests, and only soy farmers and their representatives had much reason to be in the elevators. Um, but if Sinave began to record the quality of settlements, the elevators got more crowded. Here was a constant reminder of the instrument for producing informed beans, now producing informed settlements. Not a radically transformed settlement, but slightly, but slightly strengthened settlements that, like a campesino plot with an occupancy permit, might respond slightly differently to the next inspection. It might, however, tenuously start siding with campesino projects and goals. And this is why the records, as much as the president himself, were a target of the coup. I'll leave it there. It feels so what? powerful all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You want to go? In the interest of time, since we had a few technical difficulties, I'm going to be cutting my planned presentation in half on the fly. I have started by getting rid of the first five or six so slides. But I'm going to be talking about uh, in, the concept of indigeneity and, and viewing colonial, colonialism and colonization through an indigenous lens. At the beginning of my paper, I talk about an experience I went through that is common to many indigenous people of my generation, uh, that you realize somewhere in your late teens that you are a colonized self and sets you off on a journey that has two tracks, one to decolonize yourself and another to indigenize yourself and you navigate into your adulthood um, you're, and trying to look through an indigenous lens uh, 
uh, among these two tracks, and I'm, I'm still doing that. I'm not saying I'm done that, but I've, I've come a long way. So I start by realizing that indigeneity is, by definition, it's living in a place and being, having a relationship with that place and taking the responsibility to take care of the ecosystem in that place and at the same time using some of the things that were given to you by the Creator in that ecosystem, but leaving the integrity of the ecosystem in place for the future generations. That's who gener Indigenous peoples are. You know, so get, setting us out of your mind all of the, the, the Western colonizing concepts of uh, underdevelopment and primitiveness, uh, that Indigenous peoples are the people who are tied to their land and, and, and never gave up that responsibility. And it goes back to the creation stories. So I'm going to, and by contrast, I should say before I go to the creation stories, colonization is in, in many respects the opposite of that. It is leaving the land of your, your ancestral lands and going to another place to try to colonize that place and to use the, use the resources in that place to the point where they're depleted and then moving on to another place. That's a, ver a very basic definition that you can have of colonization if you view it through an indigenous lens. So I'm gonna share with you uh, some a bit parts of the creation stories and some prophecies from two different indigenous nations, the Ash an Anishinaabe family of nations, which I am part of as an Inuit person who are usually called Cree, um, and the seal pe people in the Okanagan where I have been living for the past two decades and working with the Okanagan people and learning from them and being very glad to be a guest on their territory. I should also recognize the Salish and territory while I'm doing this uh, that we're on right, right now. <clears throat> in the Anishinaabe creation story, Nanabuju, who is the original man, he's lowered down to earth by the creator and he goes around and he, his, Part of his, his role is to go and check out the territory and see what it's like and see if it's a good place for people to live. And he, he talks to the animals and plants and he names all the animals and plants. Uh, <clears throat> and he eventually ends up meeting his wife and then he goes around looking for his father and, he, and instead he finds his grandmother. And then a great flood occurs. And b by the way, he has four, four sons when, with his wife. A great flood occurs, and this great flood you can find in many creation stories, actually even, even in the Christian creation story. And during the great flood, flood Nanabuju grab, makes a raft and he grabs as many animal species as he can. And at the end of the flood, he goes looking for other survivors and, and mainly looking for his father. And he finds his father. Um, and then they have a conflict. The son and the father have a conflict. And in the end, the father ends up say, saying, that he respects his son for challenging him in the conflict. And then Nanabuju notices that his father is partly on, in the earthly world and partly in the spirit world. He notices something about him. And at that time, his father says to him, I know you're very curious, and if you have any questions, I'll tell you anything that you ask me. And that's the beginning of the original teachings in the, in the, Ishnabi, in the Ishnabi creation story. And there's another part of the creation story I'm gonna hope to talk about later if I get time. Now in the Seals creation story, as told by Harry Robertson and documented by Wendy Wickwire in the book, Write It On Your Heart, Harry says, <clears throat> the creator thinks there should be little bushes to grow from the water. Before this, the earth was covered with water and darkness. And then they do, they come out and they have leaves. He thinks the leaves should be bigger so that six men can stand on them without sinking. The creator stands on one of the leaves and he is the first of the six to stand on it. He takes four leaves, but one of them is doubled and that makes five. And that's the, 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 the doubled one is the twin. And he says, when he says he, he means the creator, all right, you guys, get up and come alive. So now there are five men standing on four leaves. The doubled leaf contains the younger brother and the older brother. And the younger brother is the Sema, or the white man, or the European, and the older brother is the Seal, the Okanagan person. Creator told him, wait a few seconds and then lay it down slowly. He's talking about a piece of dirt. 
on one of the, bro the brother's fingers. The instant the, the, he laid down the ball of dirt, lightning started, and the second, and this, in a second, and the earth was formed. The leaves disappeared, and the, the earth replaced them. But just before that happened, the younger brother, who's standing on the twin leaf, the leaf breaks off, and it goes, starts drifting away. And remember, the younger brother is a European, and the, the older brother, the, the seal, says, when you come back, I will have a lot to teach you as he's drifting off. And this represents uh, the continent of Europe drifting off and existing on another part of, of the earth. And those are part of the seal's uh, original instructions. So creation stories form the basis of indigeneity. They, were, they give indigenous peoples their responsibilities and laws. And what is common to the hundreds of the creation stories that each of the hundreds of indigenous nations that exist uh, in the Americas and even more that exist worldwide, uh, one of the commonalities you find in most of the creation stories is that the creator puts people through, through a supernatural act on the earth and tells them that they have the responsibility to look after that part of the earth and to look after all the gifts on, on that part of the earth that exist for them to live a good life. So all the plants, the animals, the trees, the stones, the waters, everything in there is everything you need to live a good life, the creator tells the, peop the first people in most of these creation stories. And then the creator says, but you have to maintain that, the integrity of that ecosystem so that it's there for future generations. That's who indigenous peoples are, the people that maintain those laws and responsibilities. And it is expressed quite clearly in 1982 when the Assembly of First Nations is formed and they write the Declaration of First Nations, which I, bo I won't bother to read, but everything I just said is basically what it says there. So indigeneity uh, has you know, a lot of definitions, a lot of layering to it. It's obviously dealing with indigenous epistemology, epistemology and I, sh I know I shouldn't try to say that word, and, uh, and ontology. And it has to do with being indigenous and indigenous being. And people like my colleague Margot Tam has tie it to the modern day struggles that we have to protect the earth and the future generations. So it's also a contemporary condition. Colonization at its very basic definition is claiming additional lands back to a mother country. Uh, some of our students, like Natalie Chambers, have said, but colonization is much more than just the theft of land. And in the, my paper, I get into colonization of the land, colonization of the body, and colonization of the mind. <clears throat> my own personal definition of colonization that I use and find most useful for, for my own work is that it's a deliberate, organized program on the part of an invading foreign regime to f culturally and or physically eliminate indigenous peoples in order to make way for the complete foreign domination and control of the land and the resources on the land. This can only be achieved by doing three things. Debasing and delegitimizing the pre-existing institutions, indigenous laws and traditional knowledge, replacing them with foreign institutions, Western laws and knowledge, and subjugating indigenous peoples to those foreign institutions. That's the only way it can be done. I use Christian's definition, a very atypical definition of racism. He says it's an ideology of dehumanization which is deployed to misappropriate the material wealth of one group of people for the benefit of another group of people. And he says that that material wealth can be land, knowledge, and, re and resources. So to deconstruct the fundamentals of colonization. It begins with terra nullius, which is the Latin legal term which literally says nobody's land. So nobody, European Christian people give themselves the right to take over indigenous lands because the indigenous peoples aren't human beings, in other words. And that is literally what they said back in the, the uh, 16th century. And then what follows from terra nullius is the doctrine of discovery. Since they're not human beings, the Christians have the right to take over the land and they're discovering it because the people who are there are not human beings. And once, once they discover it, it becomes 
under the ownership of the mother country and of some, uh, sometimes of the Vatican. And then Manifest Destiny, I will, I'll talk about a bit later. So the beginning of doctrine of discovery comes in 1493. Actually, in the paper, I trace the doctrine of discovery back to the Christian Crusades, but I won't get into that here. But in 1493, the year after you know what happened, the Pope says this, and I won't bother reading it all, but he basically says, because, because we are Christians and Catholics, God gives us the right to take ownership over all of the other lands where indigenous peoples are out there in the world. I'll just paraphrase that in the interest of time. And this doctrine of discovery is adopted by other colonizing nation states. With that, the Pope also says that Spain and Portugal have the right to go out and claim the lands that, are, that they now know are out there in, in other continents. And it's used by other British colonies like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the, and the United States, maybe not in a former British colony, but all of these countries use the doctrine of discovery in their legal system to justify their jurisdiction over the land. Here's the first charter of Virginia, where it was used in 1606. And uh, you see the, some of the words here. In, in many of these doctrines of discovery, both in courts and in statements made by church leaders, it refers to indigenous peoples as some of these words here. Infidels, as you can see, savages, pagans. You see these words in all of these early documents. So this sets up what we call, the, is often called the triangle of colonization, where people from Europe go by, drop by Africa, pick up black slaves, indigenous peoples from Africa, bring them to the Americas, enslave them in the labor used to expropriate wealth from the, the indigenous lands of the Americas, then take the wealth back to the mother country, and then do a round again. And then just go around the triangle again and again that, like that. And you see, this is the basis of the different motives of the peoples involved in the process of colonization. Uh, you see they don't think indigenous peoples are human beings in the Americas or in Africa. You see that they, can, they justify taking the wealth back to, to Europe and not sharing it with the indigenous peoples and often uh, enslaving or exploiting indigenous labor in, in the process. In my paper, I gave, use the, ex, the example of the, the, the Spanish coffers in the, in the day were out of metal. There was no more metal to be found in Spain, very little. And the coffers was, you know, it was the gross national product of the day. They needed, they desperately needed more metal. And that was part of the, one of the main motives behind the mining of gold and silver in the Americas, which took place during the early colonization era. So in my paper, I, I go on to talk about the different phases of colonization, where first the wealth is shipped back to the mother country for the benefit of the economy and the citizens in the mother country. And then you get to a mid-stage where it appears that people from the mother country are going to stay and try to set up a nation state in the colonies. And then the wealth is, some of it is kept in the colonies, but again, not shared with the indigenous peoples. And if they have to share it with the indigenous peoples, it's in a, on a very minimal basis, i.e. the fur trade. <coughs> and that goes right up to today where, you know, fossil fuel and lumber, for example, is continuing to be exploited without the resources being shared with indigenous peoples. <coughs> Manifest destiny is something that goes back to the early 1800s in the United States where it is decided, based on the doctrine of discovery, that the American Christians should move westward and take over the whole continent right, right up to the Pacific Ocean and battle with the indigenous peoples if necessary. And the Seventh Calvary is formed to, uh, milit to militarily achieve that. We had, and this is Paul Gass, 1982, painting American progress, which is seen as the quintessential visual depiction of, of Manifest Destiny. You see the uh, Settlers moving westward, the Indians are rushing to get out of the way, and the angel is uh, escorting the settlers as they move westward. We had something similar in Canada, a westward expansion, and in my paper I talk about, well, I use uh, John Malloy's evidence in uh, the book, A National Crime, how residential school systems uh, 
I mean, assimilation, the, the Canadian government's official policy, policy of assimilation is the Canadian counterpart to Manifest Destiny. And the residential school is one of the key elements of assimilation. Um, I won't go into the details of what happened in the residential schools. I think everybody knows that. I've been working with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for the last two and a half years, and I'm kind of tired of talking about it. I, mean, and I know in a group like this, most people know what happened in those schools. But I, in the paper, I talk about it as a colonization of the body. The, the Indian Act and the reserve system, first of all, in itself, was a colonization of bodies as it corralled indigenous peoples off their territories onto crown lands, small parcels of crown lands called reserves, instilled a past system. And then section 119 of the Indian Act in 1884, when the residential school system is being established, gives Department of Indian Affairs Truden officers the authority to go into any indigenous house, household and take the children that, that aren't attending schools. And when it says schools, it means residential schools, because those are the only schools that there were for indigenous children at the time. And in section six, of, it says, a truant officer may take custody of a child when, whom he believes on reasonable grounds to be absent from school, contrary to this act, and may convey the, convey the child to the school using as much force as the circumstance requires. Colonization of the body. Colonization of the mind takes place in the schools, as we know. I won't go into that in the interest of time. But I do identify in the paper that the primary motive of the residential schools is to take children far away from their territories, their families, communities, and divest them of their traditional knowledge or cut off their access to their traditional knowledge, which is all tied to the earth and all tied to the land. And this would eliminate indigenous peoples as distinct peoples within a few generations, which was the plan. I talk in the paper about how colonization was prophesized by the seals when they, the, they, the seals knew that the little brother was going to come back, remember? And when the little brother came back, the big brother would say to him, I have a lot to teach you. Well, in the, in the Shnabe Seven Fires prophecies, we have a, a story. Um, part of the prophecies, which are all written down on rocks, by the way, seven rock panels outside of Peterborough that are over 12,000 years old. Um, the, pro the prophecies of four colors of people say that we are the red people, but there's a white people, a black people, and a yellow people out there on other continents, and they're all going to eventually come here. And the, and the, the lighter-skinned race is the first group of people that are going to come here. This gets into the, the prophecies of the seventh fires. In the first fire, it's also part of the creation story. The creator makes the people and gives the people a shell. The shell represents their spirituality, their religion, their institutions, their indigeneity. And, and at that time, the, the uh, original instructions and laws are given to live in the ecosystem and look after it. And the shell represents that. In the second fire, the second fire and the third fire just tell of migratory patterns where the peoples migrate and they come to a lake, a large body of water, which, which is speculated to be Lake Huron, and then some of them stay there and some go to the east. And then the, th the third fire, they come to a another large body of water, which is speculated to be Lake Ontario. And, w and in the, the prophecy says, they come to this body of water where, where food grows on water, and that's referring to the wild rice that used to grow on Lake Ontario and is one of the sacred foods of the Anishinaabe peoples. In the fourth fire, the lighter skin race arrives the, uh, on Turtle Island, and the prophecy says a promise is made to the Anishinaabe people by the lighter skinned race, and depending on how things occur, the circumstances go, it could go a good way or a bad way for the Anishinaabe people. And by the way, I'm giving you the short and extremely annotated version of this. The Anishinaabe elder, Jim Dumont, when he's asked to tell the prophecy of seven fires, says, do you want the three-hour version or the nine-hour version or something in between there? I'm giving you the five-minute version. <clears throat> in the fifth fire, 
the people, the Anishinaabe people, become, start to become dominated by the lighter-skinned people who came from another continent. And they almost lose their shell, lose the shell. In the sixth fire, the Anishinaabe people realize that the promise was false, and they begin to go back to the shell. And in the seventh fire, the people are on the way going back to taking their shell back. The Anishinaabe elders say, we are in the seventh fire right now. But you can see how it, these prophecies, which are more than 12,000 years old, forecast the period of colonization. How am I for time? OK, I have this chart that I made contrasting the different worldviews, indigenous and Western, on a number of issues. Maybe I'll just cover a few of them, the first ones that have to do with land. So on land tenure, indigenous peoples have a custodianship. And we often say we own the land, but we don't really mean it. It's a political statement that we make sometimes. But really, it's a custodianship relationship that we have to land, given in the original instructions. The Western people have a complete ownership, real estate, fee simple concept of land tenure. <clears throat> land use for indigenous peoples, it's for sustenance. For Western peoples, it's for profit. The resources are gifts from the creator to indigenous peoples. They're commodities to exploit by Western peoples. Resource use in the indigenous worldview is sustainable development. In the Western worldview is unrestricted exploitation and then moving on to another part of the land where that might have some more of those resources. Wealth and capital is to be shared in indi most indigenous societies. It's to be accumulated in Western societies. And the ones who accumulate the most are the ones that are, have, hold the highest social status that everybody wants to be like. And that is why, for one of the main reasons that the, the Indian Act outlawed the potlatch in 1848, which began sorry, in 1948, which began the culture ban period uh, in, in, the, in the country when, where indigenous culture was actually illegal under the Indian Act. I won't go into the others in the interest of time. So one thing I do at the end of my paper is I, I say that we've been through a few hundred years of indigenous peoples being stereotype cast by Western peoples as underdeveloped, primitive, backward. Um, and now we're in a period where indigenous peoples are viewing the situation through an indigenous lens, through the lens of indigeneity, and saying, actually, when you accuse the most important aspects of who we are as being myth mythology, our creation stories, our prophecies, our traditional stories, we're actually turning these tables around now. And we're turning the lens around. And we're saying, all of the things that you base your uh, justification for being here and for being who you are and the nation state, the former colonial nation state that you are, is actually all based on mythology. The Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in 1969, which I worked on as part of the writing team, one of the recommendations we made, we said, the doctrines of Terra Nullius and discovery are factually and morally incorrect and should never be used in the Supreme Court of Canada to justify uh, jurisdiction over land again. <laughs> but there's a number of other of these doctrines which I have up on the screen. And if you analyze them all, they're all not true. Uh, um, they're all mythology. So the world would not have been a better place, did not turn out to be a better place because the Pope said to go around the world and Catholicize people. Uh, no, no, we do not want to be like you. No, we don't come from Asia. No, we do not disappear. We're here. And then the big myth. No, you are not the people who have a monopoly on calling yourselves civilizations and, calling every, and referring to everybody else in the world as incivil, uncivilized. This is all mythology. It's mythology. OK. Well, I got through most of what I, I wanted to say, so I'll, I'll leave it at that.
get up. I mean, hopefully <laughs> we might be able to get something. But I'm just going to start. I'm going to try to make this very short so we'll have some time for discussion. Um, what I was going to start showing you were images uh, that were done from friends of ours from the Gulf Restoration Network um, after Hurricane Isaac last year. And I was going to start with uh, the email we had from the cinematographer that I had worked with last year in Louisiana. And I'll just read you what he wrote. Burras, Boothville, Cocodry, Port Fourchon, Chauvin, all underwater. These were small towns on the coast of South Louisiana where we'd interviewed fisherwomen, shrimpers, and oystermen, cleanup crew, and community activists who'd had their lives devastated by the Deepwater Horizon disaster. Now Hurricane Isaac had flooded large stretches of South Louisiana, and our friends' boats and houses were once again hit with a ferocious storm surge and inundated, an aqueous reminder of the horror of Hurricane Katrina, and proving, as if by some uh, twisted cosmic joke, that ill fate runs in three. For the surge also carried more recent incarnations of disaster. Yeah, if we can get that to play, that would be fantastic. Uh, all along the coast of Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi, a dark return of the repressed, rebutting the inane optimism of state and federal authorities, not to mention the slick $150 million advertising campaign launched by BP, which claimed that the Gulf was back, the seafood safe, and the oil dispersed. These are images, great, of oil sheen and tarmats off the coast of Bay Batiste near Bayou Dulac, a region that had been in the epicenter of the Deepwater Horizon disaster. I wanted to show you these uh, because these oily remainders, indelible and indestructible, and people are still incidentally finding oil mats uh, all along the coast of Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana seemed to me to perfectly mark the accumulating detritus and uniquely palpable record of our petro-modernity, not to mention their role as harbingers of a certain kind of future, where the return recurs in the catastrophic form of climate change and environmental devastation. Um, when Lisa and Andrea invited me to the conference, I, I have to admit I was a, a bit taken aback. I'm not an anthropologist, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I teach documentary production and film theory. And what I'm hoping to do eventually is to show you a little bit of the project that I've been working on called Offshore, which is a multi-year interactive web documentary about offshore oil, which begins with personal stories uh, from shrimpers and local residents in Louisiana, and then is traveling to Alaska, Brazil, Ghana and Russia, and we're working with local filmmakers in each of these areas to gather these stories. So it's really kind of telling the story of this proliferating oil frontier, but from the perspective of local residents and activists in each of these areas. So in, in any case, the, the more I thought about it, the more I thought that actually the trace and the record are key to understanding the long-term legacy of the Deepwater Horizon. And it, it just seemed in a very interesting kind of way. And here I'm referring not only to the designation of liability, the crucial question taken up by the ongoing civil and criminal court cases, but to the way in which public narratives that emerged to consolidate the larger social and political, if not symbolic, meaning of the event itself, narratives with very different senses of temporality and closure, appropriate, repress, or foreground these traces. And we might begin then to um, think about these differences by asking whose voices are being heard, how um, do the complex material traces of this event how are they entered into the public record? How can the collective amnesia that currently seems to surround the event three years after the explosion be disrupted by reminders of the resistant indestructibility of the trace? For it's now clear that despite the two million gallons of Corexit, the notorious dispersant that BP sprayed or injected into the Gulf in an effort to disperse the material evidence of the spill and hence their legal liability, the residues of the disaster remain not only in tar balls and tar mats, which hopefully you saw a bit of, but in the bloodstreams and lungs of cleanup crew, uh, local fisher people and coastal residents, in the gills of shrimp. Let me just see if I can get this wrong. So I keep uh, in the carcasses of dead sea turtles, oysters, and dolphins. And I think, you know, what's really interesting, and just thinking from the, the plenary this morning, 
about data and the public record in relationship to the Deepwater Horizon, because the Deepwater Horizon unleashed a plethora of data. I mean, there's a huge data stream that, that began very shortly after the event and that continues. And this is in many different multiple forms, which include anecdotal stories. There's a number of social media sites that were set up by activists in the Gulf, the Gulf Restoration Network for one of them, BP Death Photos, another where local residents went out and continued to document the deaths of marine animals all through the crisis and continues to this day. But the anecdotal isn't the only thing. One, part of the settlement with BP was that it had to fund long-term studies of the effects of the Deepwater Horizon disaster. And there's, there's um, current studies that are going on that are looking at everything from mass spectral analysis of organic aerosol to the effect on marine mammals, plankton, and the Achilles fish, to the health of wetland grasses, and, uh, and the effect of the explosion, oil, and dispersant on the insect population. But what really interests me is, uh, as, as someone who studies film and visual culture, was the role of visual records in the way in which these public narratives of the Deepwater Horizon got told. And you'll all remember those, those images of the oiled pelicans, which were uh, released very shortly after the disaster. And then quickly, they, the BP stopped uh, uh, photographers and journalists from going on the beaches. And I think uh, it was really clear that what those photos were doing was something very interesting. And that was not just simply uh, providing indexical evidence of the effect on marine species, but they had a huge effective power. Uh, I think worldwide in, in provoking international outrage. The other visual record that I think was so stunning and so interesting to think about in terms of its legacy was the uh, web streaming of the spill. And uh, as you'll remember, for 68 days that spring and summer of 2010, April 2010 to May 2010 to June, uh, we watched Transfix as that online video feed spewed dark clouds of oil into the ocean depths, a horrifying and viscous reminder of our toxic dependency. And lest we forget, which I think is quite interesting, BP only released that feed after extensive lobbying on the part of democratic politicians. And I think this has to do with the complexity of the legacy of representation around the event that's so interesting and so complex. And part of their resistance to releasing the feed, of course, had everything to do with the fact that they wanted to diminish uh, the amount of oil that could be calculated because that was going to affect their liability. But they were forced to release the footage. And what happened, of course, was that it was uh, uh, quite evident very early on that they had been lying from the very beginning. They had uh, uh, said that the average rate of flow was anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000 barrels per day. And the flow rate technical group revises significantly upward after viewing the live stream images to 62,000 barrels per day. So I think there's, you know, I think all of this really relates strongly. I was so taken with the plenary this morning because I think these kind of issues of visual regimes, regi regimes of representation, the visual record, are central to thinking about this new regime of precarity that Annalise was speaking about this morning, where disasters are no longer unusual but expected, where risk prediction becomes a useless science, but also where potentially subversive consciousness uh, that might develop as a result of these disasters is so quickly co-opted. BP had no idea about the social and political impact of those images. Uh, the feed went live on May 20th, and the site immediately crashed due to unprecedented traffic. Uh, PBS NewsHour converted the video feed to make it work on most web browsers, and the number of its YouTube channel subscribers doubled in 24 hours. And you'll all remember this. It led every news report about the disaster, et cetera. Why were we so mesmerized? Unlike the representational challenge of climate change, which, as Stephanie Le Manager notes, resists narrative because of its global scale and its as yet limited visibility. Here was an event, a veritable punctum in a field of normalized expectations, a dark trauma and ephemeral trace that in some very profound way began to materialize the humiliation of our toxic dependency on oil.
I say ephemeral because after 87 days, the well was finally capped, the oil dispersed, at least according to BP and the Obama administration. Although not, it should be pointed out, as far as coastal residents of the Gulf are concerned, whose health and livelihood continue to be severely impacted. With the live feed turned off, mass media attention moved on to other more punctual events, and the world returned to business as usual. This, by the way, was a very common complaint from the people we spoke to, who voiced intense frustration with the mainstream media, which had filled every bed near the Louisiana coast for three months, and then suddenly vacated the place in the wake of the well capping and the abrupt cessation of the live video feed. For these community activists, and there was an incredible wave of grassroots community activism sparked by the disaster, the story of the long-term impacts and effects of the spill remains an open-ended narrative without an end in sight. But it does seem to me that if we learn one thing from the deep water blowout, it was to remind us of how deeply and subliminally we're all implicated in a world made by hydrocarbons. Our lives are saturated in oil, and not only in the most obvious ways, as the fuel we heat our homes with or pour into our gas tanks, but also in the extruded form of cities, international travel, geopolitical alignments, pharmaceuticals and plastics, suburbs and car culture, resource wars and universities. As Imri Zesman has written, oil is ontology, and our capitalist modernity is unthinkable without our historic access to the cheap and abundant energy that oil provided. The paradox of oil, of course, is that while it might constitute the ontological basis of our modernity, it is to all intents and purposes invisible in our everyday life, where carbon consumption is lubricated by our collective disavowal, that our comfort and ease, the satiation of our pleasures, has nothing to do with the ecological devastation in Nigeria, or floods in Bangladesh, or elevated cancer rates in communities downstream from Alberta's tar sands, and increasingly along the Gulf Coast uh, in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon disaster. Um, and I think this is because uh, oil, uh, as many critics are now writing about, the petroleum infrastructure has become embodied memory and habitus for modern humans. We don't think about it, it's invisible to us. But perhaps habitus as a conceptual frame for thinking the invisibility and ubiquity of oils is too passive. Alan Stockel, for one, in a very interesting uh, essay in a new journal called Imaginations, which is about petroculture, talks about the agentic property of oil. It produces us as subjects, and very particular kind of subjects. We are made and remade by oil in a far more intimate and personal way in the constitution of our very subjectivities. Oil does not only produce a very specific economic system, Stokel argues, it produces very specific kind of people. I think he's on to something, despite my reservations about his unqualified use of an undifferentiated we. We know, for example, that North Americans use a disproportionate share of energy, with something like 6% of the world's population consuming 25% of global oil and gas resources. We know and yet we do nothing. Our thrall to the energy slaves of oil lulls us into a false sense of security that our current rates of consumption will remain unabated into the future, and that our petromodernity somehow transcends history. Um, and so this is sort of where we come to our project, um, because what we wanted to do with this project was to talk about these new resource frontiers that are developing, that the deep water horizon materialized momentarily in a very visible way, but in fact, it's happening everywhere around the world. Vietnam, Thailand, uh, West Africa, East Africa, Australia, Canada, the Arctic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Some of you may have followed the adventures of Shell this summer, who endeavored to start uh, the first drilling off the North Slope in Alaska and ran into a series of misadventures, including um, two times that its drill rigs got stuck on rocks as it was traveling to the site and traveling away from the site. But I think those are just premonitions of what's going to happen in the future, which many people talk about the Arctic as a new great game in terms of that development. And it raises all those qu questions about Aboriginal title to land and uh, who gets to design resource futures. So I don't know if we have the website. Okay. On Chrome. This is my computer, right? Okay. So here we are. This I'm just going to briefly take you through here, because this is kind of our way of um, 
raising this conversation about these new resource frontiers. And it's, in large, it's considered uh, in many ways as a way to document uh, an international community of activists and locals who are raising questions, questions about new kinds of resource frontiers and new kinds of resource imperialism. And hopefully it's going to let me in. It seems to be very slow. Um, but one of the things that we were very um, interested in, too, was how the whole narrative around resource extraction and oil has really changed from the 90s when you had a lot of people talking about peak oil, um, that we were actually going to run out of oil, and if we were ever going to enter into any kind of energy transition, we would do so because of scarcity, which was something we rarely talk about uh, within the context of modernity. But peak oil, uh, that whole discourse is now largely discredited because of this huge uh, and immense proliferation of non-conventional oil. And we heard uh, some of the panels this morning were talking about the tar sands. That's one example. Fracking is another. But offshore, I think, just raises all of these questions because I think what, what fascinated us about the Deepwater Horizon disaster, I don't know, I think we're not on the web. Is that possible? Because it just bumped us off. Um, was that it's invisible. We don't see it. There is no visible record. Uh, and when you try to do documentaries about it, uh, of course, oil companies shut you down and you're not allowed to go there. Most of the drilling is happening 250, 200 miles offshore. We don't know about it unless there is a disaster. And I think that's the interesting thing about um, the Deepwater Horizon uh, is that it, it made this kind of punctual impact, even though we know that spills and dis oil disasters are happening all the time. And in fact, you see this movement in places like Nigeria, where oil has been contested on the ground by local militants. And oil companies now are progressively moving offshore because they feel they can be exempt from that kind of embodied contestation. So what we're trying to do then is make oil palpable and material by giving you a simulated experience of it uh, through our interactive website where you actually fly out to a, uh, an oil rig, you land, and then you're able to, to kind of move through this labyrinth of an oil rig, and you'll run into various documentary encounters with local subjects. So I don't know if we're going to be able to show you this, but if we can't, and I should probably just end because we may be running out of time again, um, maybe we'll, we'll, I'll just end there and we can open it to discussion. If people want the website, I can uh, send you the website. It's in preview mode right now, um, but it will be up and running within the next couple of months. Okay, I'll just, I'll just show you the prologue and then uh, what I was going to do was to take you to the site where you actually hear interviews with people from uh, the Deepwater Horizon disaster who you go out in a shrimp boat with uh, a, a local fisher person who talks about the fact that and actually pulls shrimp out of the water that have oil. This is two years after the disaster that still have oil in their gills and they're seeing endless waves of deformed shrimp. Uh, we go out with an oyster person who talks about the fact that there's no juvenile oysters. This is two years after the disaster and nothing has changed in the last year. You'll also meet people who talk about the toxic poisoning. Um, many of the local fishermen work for the Vessel of Opportunity program where they were uh, encouraged by BP. It was, there was no fishing to be had, so they took these jobs going out spotting the oil. They didn't clean up the oil, but they were spotting the oil and they would spot the oil call back into headquarters and planes with dispersants would spray them and spray around them where the oil had been. They're all now uh, extremely sick. Uh, in fact, there's a huge public health crisis that's developing in Louisiana because of the high levels of benzene and other carcinogenic material that is in the bloodstream of local residents and local fishermen and people who'd been on the um, cleanup crews. <laughs> 
up the volume or? Now you've landed on the rig and you get to navigate out and you can, this is the other section and there's various voices that will be guiding you and telling you, you know, alcohol and flammable material are not allowed. And it's a, you're kind of given, it's sort of a gaming aesthetic, and you're given instructions as if you were a worker on an oil rig. You go down the hatch, and go down a well. And then I don't know if I have time to play you Okay, so we'll just turn the mic on now. And turn the volume. Thank you. Um, and now we have a discussant here, uh, Julia Murphy from uh, Portland Public. So Lisa, how long should I talk for? <laughs> really? Well, you're telling me the talk is right now. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Okay. But, um, sure. I do, you know, we want some discussion too, right? Yeah, well, I mean, okay. Let's, no, I don't want it up on the screen. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Thank you, panelists, for your wonderful, challenging, and intriguing papers, and for the um, intellectually stimulating task of trying to see the interconnections and contrasts and similarities um, and differences between them. Um, thank you for the privilege to talk about these papers. Um, and to provoke us to, and how they provoke us all to consider processes of placemaking and the record in new ways. Um, it's extraordinary, I think, and I don't think you mentioned this, Lisa, that the session brought together, I mean, it's obvious, but a filmmaker, an indigenous scholar, and an anthropologist. So, um, so the description for the session highlighted the, and I quote here, the mobilization and trajectory of diverse records in creating and re representing specific kinds of places as well as, quoting again, emerging perspectives on the intercalation of records and the environment as sources of subjugation and protest in ongoing struggles over land and land use. So that was the overarching framework that the speakers and I were presented with, and obviously each took a very different perspective. So I'd just like to make a few comments about each paper, and then um, sort of playing with those themes as they were set up, and then I have some questions for the um, for the speakers, which they can decide to address or not to address in this forum. Maybe they'd rather hear from the audience, but um, so let me see. Uh, so in Gregory's paper, rem he reminded us that the oral traditions of the First Nations are an enduring record, not only of relationships of people in places, 
but also of the moral authority of ancestors and the moral obligations or means of right living in those places. So I'm just going to refer to some different notes here. So bear with me. So I, um, I really like, you had this beautiful um, little quote at the beginning of your paper from Jeanette Armstrong. Do you mind if I read part of it? <laughs> so um, there's this concept, tmu ulash, ulash, tamok. Okay, in the, in the language called, thank you. So he, this, so this, you know, it, the English gloss is land, but the way uh, Jeanette Armstrong has explained this in English it's, is an am amalgam of time and living beings. The idea is sort of like this exact place with the concept of it being braided. It means something like, this exact place in the braided spiral of time and living beings. So that certainly gives us something to uh, think, think, think with and to appreciate it for its, uh, for its beauty. Um, as I think I just mentioned, I was also very struck in reading the paper by the creation stories, by the two creation stories, because they both contain this element, or one of the elements that they both contain was somebody um, giving knowledge to somebody else. Very important knowledge through oral dialogue. So the creation myth itself is a record of the record of another kind of knowledge being transmitted orally. So I thought it was very, they're both really, uh, that that was significant about both the, these myths and you know, it emphasizes the importance of oral tradition as a means of transmission of record through time across place. Um, and then I had, as someone who's looked into the history of Latin America <laughs> as a sideline, I, I was just, this is a question, Gregory. So the history of colonization, you draw in broad brushstrokes, and I understand the value of doing that. I was just wondering, it, you know, what might also be the value of a more detailed discussion of the particular colonial histories of different parts of the world and interactions with different um, indigenous peoples, um, as opposed to the notion that colonialism is best understood as, you know, through sameness across time and across continents. So that's just a question I have as someone who's looked at the history of Latin America. Um, and the final qu um, question, so you mentioned the sev seventh fire as the last, um, the last time period described in the Anishinaabe uh, um, narrative of the seven fires. So what kinds of record making and place making correspond to the time of the seventh fire? So that's a question for thinking. Okay. Um, and then to return to uh, Craig's interesting paper about pa Paraguay. And I got distracted. <laughs> I got distracted from his argument, and I will return to it and hopefully do it justice. <laughs> but perhaps as a result of my own ethnographic research with Mexican campesinos, I was distracted by the dramatic elements. <laughs> <laughs> or the, the performative aspects of placemaking. So this is, your emphasis was slightly different, Craig, in terms of looking at information and regulation and trying to interpret that and understand how it works. Um, but I, first of the first, you know, dramatic moment, your paper starts with this incineration of all these documents, which is very, <laughs> I just thought as an image, it was a conflagration of record. <laughs> um, and I actually wrote in my notes, who were the performers and who were the audience? And did they have a party afterwards? So, because it wasn't in the, it wasn't in his paper. He didn't tell us that they had a barbecue afterwards. <laughs> so I was like, yes, the, there are, you know, these are, I don't know that the, the full drama is also very interesting. And the theater, I, call, I made a note here, but the theater of borders, right? So you, you described in your paper, the way the campesinos would come and the, 
and the surveyors would be, or no, these are people from Senave, as distinguished from surveyors, although they're surveying these borders. And the whole, um, the whole theater of that, um, and the stakes, and the measuring tapes, and um, you know, the little transgressions onto the, to the soybean fields and so on, and the, the pieces of paper being thrown on the ground. <laughs> like, I, I just, I, um, so I was just wondering what the relationship is between sort of the theater of placemaking and the, con the way that you've interpreted your material. So hopefully that's an add-on and, and, and uh, to what you've done so well. Um, in Mexico, you know, people talk, there's a word. If you're, there's a verb, colindar, means that two properties share a border. So the two things colindan, they, but the people who own those two properties, they are colindantes. <laughs> so they are social actors through this relationship of the existence of this border. And there's even a hand motion. So you can say, oh, you have a conversation, you're talking about my colindante. <laughs> so you refer to this kind of brushing up. So uh, that was one, one, uh, one direction I don't know if you're interested in exploring, but that really struck me from your paper. Maybe you've uh, done it elsewhere. Um, and I also was struck listening today also, but, you know, the oil connection, right? So Brenda's... Um, talk about the global oil industry and, and in fact it seems to me that the expansion of the soybean industry in Paraguay is another manifestation of the you know of petroculture <laughs> in, in the current world so that's another uh, um, synergy between those two as well of course of Gregory's discussion in broader terms of colonization and resource exploitation. Um, Brenda. Oh, no, I have one other point. <laughs> In conversation with Craig, I extracted from him the fact that the campesinos that he worked with speak Guarani, which is an indigenous language of that area of the Americas. And so since Gregory had also mentioned language as an important uh, you know, aspect um, of indigenous culture and of hugely important, I just thought that was an interesting um, thing as well. So, Brenda, <laughs> I have uh, one question, um, which I will find right here. So, you've created a new kind, in your offshore website, you've created a new kind of virtual place that seems to serve as a record or want to have record-keeping functions of particular people and places as they articulate experiences of extreme oil and intervene in the public record with uh, protests and records of their own displacements and contamination and so on. Um, so I'm just wondering about placeness and place-making <laughs> in this as a political project. So, this website is, does it, it's dispersed, it's not territorialized, and how does that play into, with, or against a global, uh, hold on a sec. <laughs> is there a tension in the political project of asserting in place it is? It seems that the, you know, the, the local organizations in Nigeria and in the Gulf and so on are making, you know, assertions about the relationship, their relationship to a place, right, and their attempts to make a living in, in that place. And the website is, um, you know, a digitized, deterritorialized global space. And I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts or comments about that sort of, that tension between the use of that kind of digital space for talking about concrete, lived-in space, relationship with people and nature and environment and so on. So those are my thoughts and comments. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, <laughs>